just like to reflect a little bit from my own uh, experience, my own life first of all, and then give a few suggestions about how the fear of death can be overcome. Uh, so uh, when I was about five years old, uh, I ran into my mummy's bedroom and I said to my mum, Mummy, mummy, we're all going to die, mummy. So this uh, awareness of uh, death or immortality was, for some reason, I've never known why, uh, seems to have been with me from being very young. Uh, I grew up uh, an asthmatic, not a particularly healthy kid, uh, a lot of asthma in the summer. Uh, I partly grew up biting my nails with my comfort blanket and uh, and, you know, somewhere, some deep, right, someplace deep down in there, I always uh, had this awareness that we we're all one day going to die. So a lot of my life I've been looking for a solution to this, a way of overcoming this fear. And uh, <clears throat> when I was 17, discovering Buddhism and then uh, using that as, a, as my vehicle to investigating mind and body with this kind of background, uh, anxiety uh, or unsettled feeling about life and about the, the transience of life. Uh, so uh, studying psychology first of all and uh, taking, a, taking a psychological look at the whole thing, how to work with uh, emotions, this was helpful, you know, being, actually bringing thoughts to mind about death and uh, looking becoming aware of the fear, aware of the emotions around it. Uh, this was all helpful uh, start. But it didn't really seem to solve anything. Uh, there's still the issue hanging there. It's still going to happen. Uh, so it felt good to be at least facing up to this whole thing and of being uh, able to uh, somehow contain or or uh, have sympathy, compassion for these feelings. And then I went on from there to, to take up the study of the body, uh, working in hospitals, and working more on a kind of perceptual, philosophical level, and looking at the body, becoming more aware, having more experience of being other people around other people who were very sick or dying. Uh, Specialised a lot working with the elderly in uh, neurological disease, rehabilitation, these kinds of fields. <coughs> All the time reflecting on this whole situation and looking at this thing, trying to adjust my perception and to find an acceptable perception in my mind or a belief or a philosophy that could help me. And uh, this was also helpful. Uh, to be in Buddhist terms considering the possibility of rebirth and so on, and it's something I've revisited in recent years uh, philosophically, thinking about how the mind can survive the body, how that might be possible one way or another. And yet uh, the real solution, uh, or the ultimate solution, has come around through two roots, I think, which are very traditional, two very traditional Buddhist practices. Uh, uh, one is one, uh, something that anybody can do. So I'll present that one first of all. Uh, so uh, as part of our uh, morning meditations, often we have a chant which just reminds us of the transience of life. They're very simple. And it's saying, I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. It is. And uh, this would always be first thing in the morning, uh, which is not uh, actually the best time emotionally to be thinking about death as far as I was concerned. And yet, strangely enough, <laughs> And strangely enough, over the years of just repetition, just repeating this uh, chart over and over again, then something started to happen. I began to just accept this thought, uh, just a simple thought like that. You think of the, the context, so you're meditating first, 
I'm making the mind peaceful and then just thinking this thought this uh, works on me over time over and over again I became used to that idea uh, so I would suggest to you and this is actually a very skillful thing to do it has to, has to be done uh, with a certain uh, background or foundation and not when you're feeling down bringing this thought to mind, getting used to the thought uh, is surprisingly effective in just uh, in overcoming the fear. Uh, that was my first suggestion. That's a very simple suggestion, isn't it? When the chart is there in the books, we can just be thinking that uh, I'm of the nature to age, I've not gone beyond aging. I'm of the nature to sicken, I've not gone beyond sickness. I'm of the nature to die, I've not gone beyond dying. A very simple reflection. Just over and over, uh, the right moment when the mind is calm, open, open to that. Then I, tried, I thought I'd try and excite you by the idea of an ultimate solution. So, uh, uh, excited about this one, I have to try not to get carried away, but uh, <laughs> I had an experience uh, many years ago when I was working and I was studying anatomy, uh, I'd been meditating for quite some years and uh, also uh, doing Tai Chi, Tai Chi was actually my first meditation practice, uh, it's very mindful movement, mindfulness of the body. So quite a history there of these two practices together, mindfulness of the body and uh, meditation practice. And then there I was one day uh, studying anatomy in the morgue at the hospital. Uh, and I spent the afternoon examining the back of somebody's leg. It was a specimen of somebody's leg which had been opened up to show the hamstrings, the muscles at the back of the leg. I was uh, currently uh, studying the treatment of hamstring injuries. So uh, what we were doing was handling the, these uh, exposed muscles and tendons in the back of the leg with a view to treating these uh, strains and sprains and other injuries. So I spent the entire afternoon with this very smelly old leg came out, it was reeling a bit from the smell of the formaldehyde, <clears throat> and having been one of my first sessions in the morgue, it was a bit of a disturbing experience. And all my friends, <clears throat> all my uh, fellow students went straight, took the right turn out of the anatomy uh, lecture hall, straight to the pub just down the road, and, uh, and being a faithful Buddhist and meditator, <laughs> I turned left and started doing my Tai Chi walking down the road try and steady my mind, it's feeling a little bit shaky. And uh, uh, something quite marvellous happened where I, su I suddenly saw into the back of my leg, uh, like kind of x-ray vision. So I, started, I saw the hamstrings working in the back of my legs, quite an amazing experience actually. No idea that was possible. My mind went extremely peaceful and bright and open. And there was no fear of death. So you know, I recognised that coming out of the morgue, you know, then there was a fear of death. You know, there was a there was a niggling anxiety there. And despite uh, by trying by all my attempts to apply my mind to my anatomy, uh, then there was this emotional niggly fear there, anxiety, uh, which completely disappeared through this experience. Uh, it's a very wonderful experience, and that's an experience I've been following for ever since, in a way, and trying to find out about it. Never can't say I've ever fully explained it. Can't say really I try and explain it anymore. But the fact is that <coughs> you know, this experience happened uh, about 25 years ago now, and I find that if I can get myself to that space and this kind of brightness, this. Uh, bright samadhi, <clears throat> this kind of samadhi, then you 
inevitably, every time, uh, all my anxiety disappears, all my fears disappear. There's a tremendous sense of peace and uh, confidence. Uh, so to me, that's, a, that's the ultimate solution. Uh, in Buddhist terms, then what we would understand to be happening is that the, the mind is detaching from the body and seeing the body as not self, seeing the body and the mind separate things, the brightness of the mind and the body together. And you're seeing the body quite clearly as not self, and therefore the fear of death disappears as naturally. So this is something that uh, uh, my belief is that this is uh, this is the way <coughs> that uh, we overcome death or over, overcome death. Never mind the fear of death, uh, and that this is uh, where we're aided, headed in uh, our Buddhist practice. This is the ultimate in terms of Buddhist practice to find this this this, uh, this marvelous, bright, free, liberated state. That comes from seeing that the body is not who and what we are. So I thought I'd like to offer that to you as a bit my personal story. Uh, and uh, at a time like this, when uh, you know we have this uh, still this coronavirus situation, it looks like it's going to be quite a long haul, doesn't it? Uh, a lot of time on our own, maybe quite a life, restricted life. And I would. Uh, I'm hoping, of course, that I can inspire you to, to take this time to meditate and to look for this solution to overcome your fear in the same way that I did. You've got the time and uh, maybe you've got the fear as well, isn't it? Particularly if the, the virus is looming close. Certainly, uh, my people I know in England, friends I know in England, is, is getting pretty close. Uh, a monastery in England, uh, there's an old people's home just out the back of the monastery, about two or three minutes walk away actually. Uh, four people died there last week. So the virus is very close. And here, luckily, uh, there's, some, there's still quite a few cases in the local hospitals, but it's not, not really looming that close. Nobody we know around here has been seriously sick or died of it yet. Uh, and also uh, with my family, uh, and then my, my old primary school headmaster died last week. Uh, he's 90, uh, a quite very close friend of the family. And our mother was quite upset about that. So that, that brought things a bit closer. Every time I find, you know, the, the ways of uh, emotion can arise, if I establish my mind on the body, and mindfulness of the body, uh, and find this brightness, then the uh, fear of death will immediately disappear. In fact, all my anxiety seems to dis <laughs> seems to disappear. Uh, which, uh, of course, I might I might try and theorise about that and say. Perhaps all our anxiety is really uh, connected with death. Uh, uh, maybe that's not so. It can seem like that. Uh, this solution for the fear of death seems to be a solution for other fears and anxieties. Uh, that seems to be true. And yet it's a place, a space that we have to try and get to and find and get to over and over again. Like, a, like finding our refuge, refuge in the Buddha this space, this brightness. So I hope that's interesting to you. I don't know if anyone, anyone wants to put anything into the chat, remember you can, uh, you're very welcome to type something in there. It's, uh, we already have a comment from, uh, from Gordon. It's, uh, uh, Gordon is, uh, is a reverend. I hope you don't mind me telling everyone Gordon. Gordon is a, a reverend in the uh, United Church of Canada. So we're very privileged to have him here. He's also the father of our uh, dear Anna Garrick, Gordon, who's been living here for over a year. 
it says uh, uh, how amazing that we have the whole world in a similar situation. It underlines that we're truly a global family. Absolutely. Uh, the positive part of this whole crisis has been that people pulling together more as a family. Uh, certainly you've seen this in England. Uh, I don't know so much about everywhere, but in my family in England I hear a lot of stories of acts of kindness and people being very, very kind to my mother and brother who are both in isolation. Uh, so my brother, for example, he's, he uh, couldn't get to the chemist for, for my mother's medication, run out of medication. And a policeman called to the house to check that he was keeping to his isolation, that he, was, he wasn't he was being a good boy. And my brother told him, well, yes, I'm staying inside, but I can't go to the chemist to get my medication. So the policeman immediately offered to go to the chemist for my brother. Uh, that was very nice. Uh, he said, well, I could, even, I could even use my warrant card, you know, my special ID card, to get to the front of the queue, but I don't think I'll do that. But I'm happy to go and get your, your medication for you. That's very nice, isn't it? Very spontaneous uh, kindness. And a lot of that... Uh, and then the coronavirus can turn into the coronavirus, can't it? The corona compassion. <laughs> so it turns into the coronavirus instead of the coronavirus. <laughs> Certainly seems to be doing that in some some circles. Uh, of course, there's a, a, few de a few desperate people, I, I suspect, as well, isn't it? Bless them. Uh, somebody's asked, in seeking the perception of mind and body is separated, is there a risk of stumbling into dissociation and aversion toward the body and its needs? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, and not if we're doing it in a meditative way. So if we're, if we're thinking about the mind and body as separate things, then yes, there is a risk of developing a dissociated, dissociated perception of mind and body uh, or dissociated idea uh, of mind and body or developing aversion towards the body or uh, disinterest in the body or uh, this, these kinds of things. But if we arrive at this uh, experience through meditation, then there aren't any of these uh, dangers. The mind is peaceful when it when it sees the body, and uh, the, the mind is very open. So uh, and loving. You know, the, the mind that sees with wisdom also sees with compassion. Those two qualities are uh, completely conjoined with each other. So there isn't any wisdom without compassion. When you see the body in this open space then you also have compassion so you're not in any way indifferent uh, you're wanting to help uh, next question somebody asks uh, is Jordan, who's an ex-monk um, is asking have you looked into the possibility of going to autopsies here in Norway so uh, no, we haven't, actually. Uh, this is a common practice in Asia that monks were invited to go and see autopsies to uh, contemplate the body. But uh, we, tried, we tried asking in England, and uh, it, they, we got turned down. And we haven't asked in Norway yet. We, we, we assume we'll get turned down just the same. Uh, they usually, these uh, sessions are usually very, very uh, technical, uh, closed things. There are not many doctors who want to invite observers into an autopsy uh, other than the students. Uh, so, uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't approached that. That's actually, you know, to, to do something like that, that's, that's quite an uh, advanced thing to be doing. Uh, when we did this in Thailand, we were always... Uh, well prepared, 
Well, I actually, <laughs> I'll always remember we're going with one group and the youngest member of the group is 12, the summoner of 12, or two of them actually, 12 and 13, I think. And uh, I was a bit concerned at taking two young kids into an autopsy, so they could be really disturbed by it. Actually, they loved it, they thought it was. <laughs> The adults were much more disturbed than the kids were. <laughs> An interesting one. <clears throat> so you develop a child's eyes at these things. You know, the inside of the body is a wow thing. You know, open it up. Oh, wow, look at that. So there's a nice sharing here from uh, Gordon, who, uh, who's a Gordon, as I said, he's a, a reverend in the United Church of Canada. Um, so as a Christian, his experience of dying and being with people who are dying uh, has been one of moving into the light. So uh, this is a <clears throat> so this is a when people are actually dying, isn't it? Then they could be letting go of the body and moving towards the light. And, this is so, so in this way you can see this kind of meditation I've talked, been talking about is a kind of dying practice, isn't it? That we're, we're dying before we die, uh, moving into the light before we die, so dying before we die. And that's, a, that's, in a way the, the, that's another way of talking about how, how the fear is resolved, is this sense of dying before you die. Uh, We have uh, somebody, another comment here. I've been doing mindfulness meditation with a group of people. We're finding that doing self-compassion is helping in dealing with the anxieties that the virus has created in people to people. Uh, yes, well, so uh, thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this practice is a very well. Uh, very well articulated and popular practice right now in Norway, actually. A lot of psychologists are developing this uh, uh, practice of having compassion for, for yourself. So as, as, as I say about this wisdom practice, the wisdom practice has is very much a compassion practice at the same time. So. Uh, if you imagine that when I was developing mindfulness of the body, I was doing it in a medical context, uh, looking to help the body. And the compassion was there in the first place, and then the, the wisdom came on top, if you like. Uh, but for many people, a way in is uh, particularly in this, with this self-critical uh, nature of the Western mind is to uh, soften to ourselves, have compassion for ourselves to overcome our self-critical mind. Uh, this is often a hindrance to people. Uh, our hindrance is towards samadhi, or concentration of the mind, uh, are the same as the hindrances towards seeing the body, and, and seeing the body within this open mind, and seeing the body and mind clearly. So in the modern world, it's a self-critical mind. It's a very predominant hindrance. Uh, at this time, uh, the added anxiety uh, and being able to counter uh, our anxieties through having a passion for ourselves, that's a very skillful practice. So, yes, thank you for that. I'm not quite sure what the interest is on which group of people this is. Uh, and uh, Linda... Uh, is there anything while we're waiting? Is there, uh, perhaps we can uh, invite Gordon? Would you like to say anything about your, your experience for us, uh, being, being with people who are dying and this experience of life? We would uh, be delighted if you'd like to share something with us about that. You'd be very welcome, Gordon. If you want to put your microphone on, I'd be very happy to hear from you. You see, click the left, click the little circle on the left to 
on the yes, side. Okay. Does that work? Can you hear me? Yeah, that, yeah we can hear you. Yes, welcome, Alan Gordon. Good, That's thank you. Mind. Well, over one, there's many wonderful things happening in uh, Alberta, where, where I'm from, in helping people to deal with the, the anxieties of the coronavirus. And the group that I have joined for the past month has been a counselor from uh, a counseling center, a good friend of mine who is doing um, mindfulness meditation each Wednesday at one o'clock. And he gives theory on uh, a variety of different approaches and then we meditate together. So it's a variety of people who are Christian, non-Christian, there are some Buddhists who are part of it, and it's a very interesting connection, and I have found it very, very helpful to me, and I find I can use this uh, mindfulness and this whole approach to self-compassion uh, daily as I deal with the anxieties that, uh, that I face. So it's, it's sort of in that way that our our faith communities really cross and support one another because this is certainly very much comes from the Buddhist tradition and I as a Christian and my Christian friends really appreciate the whole mindfulness approach. Thank you very much, Gordon. Yeah, there's, uh, there are many groups, uh, of course, for these groups that uh, are non uh, doctrinal in a sense. Uh, there's, no, there's no teaching uh, of one religion or another, it's just uh, developing uh, mindfulness and then, uh, <clears throat> within an open group, open situation. Um, so very inspiring to hear that, and always and very nice to, to see the people coming together like this. So, uh, thank you very much for that, Gordon. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to just add that we're doing this yeah. through the whole. Uh, aspect of the Zoom, the Zoom program, which is allowing people now to connect with one another without being physically present. And this has just transformed our connection to people through this virus time. It's just been a tremendously positive and helpful thing. Yes, thank you. Yes, we're, we're trying our best. We haven't, we haven't managed to get Zoom up yet. We're still struggling with Skype. But uh, yes, it's, a, it's amazing how uh, people manage to connect uh, on the telly. <laughs> uh, so I, I was quite uh, wondering how it was going to go at the beginning, but uh, it seems to go quite well. And uh, we have people, if our group here, Gordon, is very widespread, uh, even Norway, it's a big, quite a big long country. Uh, so we have people joining us from way up north who can't get here. Uh, in the best of times. So, uh, yes, it seems to be that uh, this thing's bringing the community together. Uh, it's a great uh, feeling. Uh, so I have another question about whether I'm going to be teaching Tai Chi online. That's a trick there from Shani. Uh, I think that's going to be a tricky one, Shani, with me uh, wired up. And <laughs> but... Uh, Yes, uh, certainly you know, Tai Chi and Qi Kung is always uh, these two things. So uh, if anyone else out there is practicing these, but uh, these have been really fundamental for me in developing mindfulness of the body. So like uh, taking the mind right into the body. Uh, of course, yoga also. Uh, I see Lena there. Hello, Lena. Uh, incidentally, uh, long-term yoga practitioner. Uh, uh, yoga also very good at... Uh, bringing the mind into the body. Uh, and then well, one day maybe you get this sort of image appearing. This is a kind of culmination of mindfulness of the body. It's an image appearing of the, of the body and the mind. 